Well, if you're trying to be the best of all worlds and the jack of all trades, you can't physically niche down far enough in your content and your messaging to be able to target that perfect type of client or project. And that's when you get stuck losing money on a tile job because you're a flooring company. You're listening to Toolbox of the Trades, brought to you by Service Titan, a podcast for top service professionals where we interview leaders for their best tips and tricks of the trades. Learn how industry trailblazers stay ahead of the competition and how you too can be at the forefront of an industry. Let's jump in. Hello, contractors, and welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades. Today's guest is Mike Claudio, the owner of WinRate Consulting and host of the Big Stud Sales podcast and the Remodeling the Carolinas podcast. A few years ago, Mike embarked on a mission to help contractors improve their sales and grow their business using the tools he learned early on in his corporate career. After helping his friends scale his residential remodeling business from $280,000 a year to $2.2 million a year, Mike's developed a system that helps contractors in every trade market to the modern day tech savvy customer, which is one of the many reasons I wanted to talk to him. Mike is a great communicator, total straight shooter, and isn't shy about sharing his top coaching tips. Enjoy. Mike Claudio, welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades. Excited to be here. We've been talking about it for a little while and pumped to finally make it happen. Yeah, same here. So why don't you tell the folks who are listening a little bit about yourself? So Mike Claudio, I own WinRate Consulting. I do business development, leadership, and sales coaching for the home service industry, primarily the remodeling side of things. My career started in corporate America, sales, sales leadership, got into the remodeling industry as vice president business development for a general contractor probably seven years ago at this point. Did that for a few years, was vice president business development for a roofing company. We did uh, residential and commercial roofing for a few years, then I got into coaching full time. And then actually recently partnered with a good friend of mine and started a site grading and demo company. So I was actually itching to get back into the industry. It's been about two years since I've run a company actually in the industry. I've been coaching full time since then, but so that's a very high level review of, uh, of my resume. I love it. And you just kind of blew out my next two questions out of the water into how you got into the trades. So you really came in through the corporate path. So tell me, what is it about the trades that really gets you excited and interested and, you know, happy to work? So at the time, it wasn't as much what was I excited to go into as what I was tired of dealing with and getting out of. So I had been in corporate America for almost 10 years and a really good buddy of mine was a residential remodeler, like really great carpenter, really great site manager, high quality guy, high quality service, really struggled on the sales and business development and just general like running a business. He was great as a technician, as a, as a hands-on guy, which a lot of people in this industry are. They say, let me start a business, which he did. And he was successful to a point. He moved his business to Charlotte where I am um, in like 2011, 2012, which is when we met. And he came from the DC market and struggled getting his core business back running again. And so he was kind of struggling. I had always wanted to work for a smaller company and a portion of my corporate America world, my vertical was construction manufacturing. So I sold te connected technology to the industry. So I got really integrated into the people, the stories, the families, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to be in the industry. This opportunity will say presented itself. And you may give everybody here kind of appreciate this. I left, I worked for Verizon Wireless for almost 10 years in different capacities. You know, it's a $70 billion company to go help my buddy who was doing like 280 grand a year and grow sales, grow his business. Like talk about a just transition of environment and I don't call it culture shock, but generally I was excited about the challenge. But, you know, as somebody who had never really been in the industry, I took over sales, marketing and estimating for a remodeling company, which is where I learned basically how to tweak the processes I learned in corporate America from a professionalism, communication, organization, leadership, and then learned kind of like every trade because I had to know every trade to quote properly, right? And that's really where I think my, my real passion for the industry came. So I think I got into it because I was trying to get away from something and I saw this as an opportunity, but then like really my passion for this industry came by learning how to scale, I, mean, I grew, we, he, we did uh, my second year there, we did 2.2 million. So like, I mean, I 10 X that business and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I went through a lot of growing pains 
Like I learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Like I know what a lot of home service people are dealing with because I've been in those conversations. I've knocked on those doors. I've made the mistakes. I've screwed proposals up. I've messed scope up. I did the marketing wrong. I networked wrong, prospect wrong. So I, I say all that to say like I failed really hard, but I failed forward. I figured it out. I solved those problems. And that's really what led to me coaching these companies now is it, like I'm not coming from a position of theory and concept. I'm coming from a, no, you want to see the scar? I got that scar right here. I got it. I learned that. Here's why you don't want to do it that way. And it gives me a certain level of credibility, I think. And I mean, you've seen some of my content. Mm -hmm. just, I, I'm able to relate to these people in the industry, specifically business owners in that remodeling space. But ultimately my process is very, I'll say horizontal. Like my leadership, the structure, the way I sell, the way I market, the way I teach about leadership and business development, I'm confident there isn't a product or service that somebody sells that I wouldn't be able to create some sort of positive impact in their business. So I stayed in the industry because I thought my relative experience made the most sense. But like my passion for it now is I've seen so many of these guys work five, 10, 15, 20 years and have nothing to show for it because they've just been doing it the same way forever. And everybody knows if you've been in the industry for more, like at least 10 years, the market's different. The client base is different. The expectations are different, wildly different. And if you're not adapting to that, you're going to feel like you're constantly in the business and the business is constantly on your shoulders. And I want to help these guys come out the other end with something to show for it because the industry is aging out and there's not a lot of new people coming in, which means the opportunities are going to become greater and greater, but they are not going to find them if you don't adjust your approach. So that's where my passion comes now. It's, it might be for the industry, but more it's for the people who are in the industry who have incredible skill sets, but don't know how to actually grow a profitable, large scale, not only say large scale, just a profitable business with it. Well, yeah. And thank you for elaborating on that. I loved everything about your answer. I mean, for one, just going from a $70 billion a year company like Verizon, I can just hear people grumbling about Verizon as they listen to this, <laughs> uh, to 280K a year to 2.2 million. I mean, holy crap, like look at the impact you can see. I can only imagine what that must mean for you professionally to be able to see that type of growth and say, I helped do that. Well, yeah. And then, um, but like a lot of contractors, like that was his, that was his next plateau and that's where he wanted to stay. He didn't want to get bigger, which is why I moved on to the roofing company and took them from like two to five to 6 million in a couple of years. And same thing. So I saw the next level of growth and challenges with a lot more employees, a lot more over it, a lot more stuff going on there. And I just realized that I wanted to have more of an impact on the business as opposed to just the business owner I was working with. And selfishly, like I saw myself getting handcuffed by the operation I was working for because my skill set in sales and business development was exceeding the operational capacity of the companies I was working for. Mm. So I was actually having to slow down some. And as a business development guy, like that's what gets me going. I was having to like, I want to say handcuff, but I had to throttle my efforts because the business can only scale so fast. And like, so that's kind of where I got into running my own consult, consulting coaching business because I want to help more people. And there's a lot of people out there that need help. So yeah, totally. I mean, and something too, you, you touched upon, right? Like they're, the, these guys that you work with, these men and women, I should say, um, you know, they're ex exceptional technicians. They're really good at what they do, but that talent can only take them so far. So where you come in as a consultant, talk to me about some of like, the common themes that you see when you first go in to help a business when it comes to sales, biz dev and marketing. So I'm going to give it, um, I might, I'm going to give it a different twist on the answer. I think in a way, please you twist away. So, so one of the biggest things I see, I would say 70% to 78% of what I teach, most business owners have heard before. Mm. Like I'm not teaching them something new. What they lack is the ability to conceptualize and implement that learning, that knowledge into their ecosystem. They're like, oh, that's a great idea, but I don't know how to make that work for me. Like, oh, that's a great idea, but how do I make that work in my system? Oh, it's a great idea, but how do I get my employees doing that? And then when they hit that first hurdle, not all, but a lot will say, well, it's not worth the headache of going through that struggle. It's not worth the, the risk of the investment. I'm safe where I am. So I think what I actually do from an, the accountability and oversight that I bring is give people permission to move forward with the ideas they already had by giving them the way to implement into their business. Because when I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one coach with a client, 
I'm in your business. Like I'm, we're talking very particular to you. There's a lot of content out there that's very generalized to a standpoint and it's totally. hard to conceptualize it into your ecosystem. But what I do is come in and say, no, you need John to do it this way. And Sally needs to track it this way. And here's what the application you need to implement to make it all work together. And when I, when I help them paint that picture and make it feasible, I mean, I'll tell you, and the results have been phenomenal. Like I've only been coaching full time for less than two years, probably a little over 18 months. I've one on one coached almost 40 companies at this point. That's and, awesome. And I've group coached almost 90 companies. Some of my clients are having breakout years right now, like that's record awesome. setting months. There's a lot of people that have that same, and that's great, but there's a lot of people that don't. And a lot of times it's because they didn't implement that thing last year that they knew they should have, but didn't know how, and they weren't sure they could afford it or weren't sure it would work. What I do is help them get over that hump by not only just making it relative their, to their world, but then also holding them accountable to the steps to get it done, right? Because we get too busy for stuff. Oh, right? we totally. Get, we get overwhelmed by this or too busy for that. And you don't make the time to implement the things you need to. Well, one of the bigger things I do is bring in the accountability because I meet with my clients every week. And I'm like, hey, did you do that thing we talked about doing? No, well, why not? What stopped you? What happened? Okay, let's work on your time management. Let's work on this. Let's get that person bought in. Let's get that person hired. Let's make this happen. And it's it's been great to see people that will say things like, man, Mike, like I knew I should have done this a few years ago. Thanks for helping me make it happen. So I think that's the bigger thing. I'm not sure it's one thing with sales or one thing with business development. I think there's, I take a very holistic approach because I don't, I'm not going in to teach you my process. I'm going in to fine tune the process you already have. What are the mm. gaps in that process? How do we make certain things better? Because what works for one person isn't going to work for somebody else based on experience, based on background, based on perception, based on region, because I have clients all over the country. So like what works in Long Island isn't going to work in Arizona, right? Like it's yeah. just not going to. So my goal is not to come in you and, and like say, here's the step-by-step -step process you need to follow. No, it's, hey, let's look at your whole process. Let's find the gaps. Let's create some efficiencies. Let's create some ways that you can become more effective in how you're communicating. And then let's solve the biggest, hairiest problem first and then work our way through the systems as we go throughout the engagement. So that's, I think, it's been surprising that I didn't realize how kind of rare that was just hearing people, like the feedback I've gotten where... A lot of times someone comes in, they only know how to teach that one thing. Well, what I know how to do is, is grow businesses. So there isn't one thing, there isn't one system or process, and there isn't one cookie cutter way to do anything, especially in this industry. So I think that's been one of the bigger aha moments for me as a coach is that even like franchises, like just don't get the support they need from the mothership, from a training and, and implementation and, and accountability perspective. That's really great. Thank you for explaining that. It really sounds like you take these general ideas that live on the internet and you do exactly what you just said, relate it to their ecosystem and hold them accountable, which I feel like as human beings, and correct me if you think otherwise, we feel like we really have to go it alone and we are so hesitant to really ask for help. But some of the most successful contractors I've talked with have worked with coaches like you, have worked with best practices groups and have, you know, held that accountability with a third party outside of their organization. It is so easy to let your day get consumed by putting out fires and not thinking about your company in the broader sense. And what are the moves I can make today that will push me forward in the next year? Well, and the biggest thing is, is no matter how alone or on an island you feel as a business owner, somebody's already beaten the challenges you're going through. So why try and do it on your own? Like if you're averaging 500K a year and you'd love to see a million, but you don't know how to get there, go ask somebody that's at two or 3 million, right? Like, I mean, just that just, I don't wanna say it's common sense, but so many people are afraid to get out of their own way and get their ego get in the way or they're, I'm too busy to have a conversation. If that conversation makes you an extra half a million dollars next year, you shouldn't be too busy for that. Yeah. And I, and I run into that a lot with the ego side of the industry where, you just don't understand the world I live in, Mike. Mm, that's a really selfish way to look at your situation. Yeah, I, I'm a total psychology nerd, so I want to get into the ego stuff. But before I do, we've <laughs> mentioned uh, industry and trades. You mentioned remodeling. You, you mentioned construction. You mentioned how you had to learn all like the different trades. Can you just give like a, a list essentially of, of the different areas that you've worked in personally, that you've coached in, so this way our listeners can kind of know, you know where you operate? 
like areas as in geographically or like types of businesses? Types of businesses, I should okay, say. Yeah, so so I, I worked for a remodeler for almost three years, ba bathrooms, kitchens, additions. I worked for a residential and commercial roofing company for two years where I was vice president. I had three sales guys and my own pipeline. Um, it's actually a running joke. So I had never climbed on a roof before I joined the roofing company. <laughs> I hadn't, and I didn't like it. And I, I'm, I'm kind of a top heavy guy. Like I'm not gonna, I, I'm not a balanced athlete. I'm a 250 pounds and very broad shoulders. I'm not built to be walking on roofs. But my, uh, my second year there, I sold like $4 million in roofing and I only got on two roofs the whole year. So like, it was a running joke that I could, I sold more roofs from the ground than any salesperson he had ever seen before. <laughs> but it's, it's the process. It's how I communicate, it's how a relative. But since then, since I've been coaching, I mean, it's very, it's been a very broad approach to home service companies. If you're selling a product or service to homeowners, like I've helped flooring companies, restoration companies, remodelers, painters, garage door companies, like kind of, if you're selling a product or service to a homeowner, that's, that's where I've kind of been, I've kind of planted my flag and trying to build a, a nationwide presence around. So Honestly, it's, I've helped companies outside of that space as well. Like I have a, a company right now who actually focuses on the construction industry to help them better understand their client base. So if you're somebody who sells B2B to contractors, because I was on the contractor side and then I was on the sub side, I've seen it from both perspectives. So I can be, bring a lot of value to that, that place as well. But B2C has been my primary focus for my content, but B2B is actually where more of my success actually came in my career. Oh, interesting. So it yeah. sounds like a lot of what you do, especially because, you know, we've been saying sales, marketing and business development is really about understanding your buyer. A hundred and ten percent. What I've actually, so I've had a few people like I, as a coach consultant, when you're dealing with business on a regular basis and you become a really good problem solver, they start dumping all your problems on you. And uh, I've actually turned into what somewhat sort of a business therapist more than a business coach. But what I am is a communication expert. I know how to create a message that matters for the right type of audience and figure out what that ideal client is. How do I target them? What to do to qualify? How to differentiate yourself in the sales process? How to follow up appropriately? How to use a CRM? How to organize that stuff? So, you know, my success is on the sales. Side. Like, I can't teach anybody how to get better at their books. I'm not a bookkeeping guy. Like, that's Sean Van Dyke. You need help with that? Call Sean Van Dyke, right? Like, that dude's got, he is, he wrote Profit First for Contractors. He's the numbers guy. That's not my space. So I kind of stay in my lane to an extent, but if it comes to communicating internally or externally, that's where I do my best work. So if you're struggling with culture or communication or client experience or just general sales and business development, that's kind of my, how to communicate the right way to get the right message across to the right people to gain the right types of clients. Got it. So you're talking, you can talk about it not only from the B2C space, the homeowner, but also from the B2B space. So if your construction business also looking to broke deals with buildings or new construction opportunities, right? Yep. Huh, man, I have so many different ways <laughs> I want to take this because you, you're really, your experience is incredibly broad and I mean, I feel like you have so many nuggets of information. It's just, a, it's just, I need to decide where I want to dig. So, I mean, construction is obviously really big. Yeah. What are some of the common problems you encounter when working with clients who primarily focus on construction? I think a clear vision. I think one of the bigger things is people trying to say yes to everything. You know, they're mm -hmm. like, no job too big or too small. That's not true. Like that, that can't be true. And, and why I say that is, is when you promote yourself as I do small work and I do big work, what happens is, is you create brand confusion. Mm -hmm. People, People who want big work will say, well, he does little work. Maybe this is too big for him. Or people who want little work will say, well, he does big work. You know, maybe I'm, he's too expensive for me. Or someone says, well, I don't even really know what Mike does because last week he was doing gutters and this week he's doing an addition and next week he's doing a kitchen remodel, right? So I see a lot of that where businesses are unable to niche themselves down to become the authority in a product or service and maybe a number of product or services but like, you can't be the roofer who also does fences and think you're going to win. Like, it's very difficult to, to tell that story and give that content and create that message to your marketplace where you build credibility, the no like, and trust factor for like every service. Like, I'm sure you've seen it. The, the truck driving down the road that has 27 different services on the side of it. You think you're helping yourself by casting a larger net, but what you're doing is, is like, everybody knows you can't be the best at all of those. So they're going to say, well, it's kind of Russian roulette to an extent where what, <laughs> which one of those services are they actually good at? And you're, you're making it more difficult for yourself. I, I literally, 
I would say like the first part of my process, I kind of have a four pillar approach initially is identify. You've got to identify what your ideal project and ideal client base looks like so you can target them effectively. If you're trying to be no job, too big, too small, you don't know what to say because you have to be so broad in your content. You're not actually saying anything. I'll give you you're a saying, I'll You're give saying, you a do you have a problem? I have a solution. Or you're saying, we've been in business for 30 years and operate with integrity. What, you're not differentiating yourself. The only way that message works is if somebody else is saying, hey, do business with me at your own risk. I might take advantage of you. But no one says that, right? So saying you operate with integrity doesn't mean anything. You have to show it and you have to articulate it in real life examples and in real life you know, interactions in your day-to-day -day content, your day-to-day -day interaction with your audience. Well, if you're trying to be the best of all worlds and the jack of all trades, you can't physically niche down far enough in your content and your messaging to be able to target that perfect type of client or project. And that's when you get stuck losing money on a tile job because you're a flooring company and you're like, well, you know, I could make money doing it, so we should at least try. No, be willing to say no to that so you can spend more time doing stuff you are actually profitable and efficient at. And the other side of that is when your guys do the same work every day, they create different efficiencies in their process. They are create different efficiencies in how they prep for jobs. But if they are, if they need different tools and different material every day they show up to a job site, you're going to become incredibly inefficient because they just don't know what they're getting into today. Or they may not even like doing that job you sold. But, hey, guys, I know you don't really like doing flooring, but, you know, guys got to do what a guy's got to do. Well, your disgruntled employee is going to be on that job site bitching about the job he's doing in front of your client base. He's also probably going to leave you. Is that worth the extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars you're going to make on that job because you took on a service that you probably shouldn't have? No, but people have such a scarcity mindset around, well, I can't say no, or where's my next lead going to come from? That's part of developing a machine that's going to deliver high quality leads into your pipe on a consistent basis. So if you know you have more leads coming, you're more apt to say no. But if you don't know where your next lead's coming from because you don't have a good process for that, you have to say yes to everything because you're scared that you're not going to get another one. And that's where guys get into this habit of like just taking on anything and everything and it absolutely drags their business down. And I've done it personally. I've said no to services. I've turned off services at businesses and double revenues by focusing on what we were actually good at. I want to ask about how um, a business should go about deciding what their specialization is because I've heard this talked about before. But real quickly, can you also tell me about the other three pillars of your process? Sure. So identify is first, target is second, qualify as third, acquire as fourth. So first you identify what your ideal client is, then you figure out how to go out and target them through prospecting, networking, social media, that kind of stuff. Learn how to qualify a lead when it comes in because every person listening has driven an hour to a job that when the minute they walked in said, I shouldn't be here, this isn't gonna be a good opportunity. Everybody's done it. So learn how to qualify proactively in your content as well as reactively when they call in and then acquire, how to differentiate yourself before, during and after meetings to make you the obvious choice to, to win that deal. Love so that. I target, qualify, acquire. Those are the four pillars of my sales and business development training. I think that's incredible. And I agree with it wholeheartedly. So talk to me a little bit about specialization. So if you have, you know, say a contractor who decided to go into business on his own, he does a little bit of plumbing, he does a little bit of HVAC, he does a little bit of everything. What advice would you give to him to figure out, you know, where should you focus right now? What, what is your niche? So if you're new, let's say from that, that example, you're new, you're getting in there, you're not sure yet, it can be challenging. I would pick whatever you think you can be most profitable and efficient doing, right? So if you know that you're really fast at wood rot, go focus on wood rot and then test other things out as you have consistent cash flow. But if you've been in business, let's say for at least a year, which I would say majority of your audience has probably been in business for at least a year. Look back to the last six to 12 months, Make a list of your top 10 most profitable projects and your top 10 most enjoyable client experiences. Ideally, there's some overlap on that list. Let's say three to four clients, there's overlap. They were the top most profitable and they were the top most you know, enjoyable client experiences. Because you can all, everybody listening right now can think of that, that client that was like, man, they were so awesome to work for and we made a bunch of money on that project. We'll take those three or four people and then make a list, 10 things about them that were similar demographically and 10 things that were similar about them psychographically. So not only where do they live, what's their income, female, male, interests, but then like 
what are their hobbies? Where do they hang out? What do they talk about? What are their interests? Because like, I'll tell you, like when I went through this process with the remodeling company, I realized that three or four of our most recent projects that went really well were they were the owners of the homes were all into cycling, like bike road biking. Hmm. So I said, hmm, well, if these people think the same, maybe more do. So I targeted bike clubs for a little while. And I closed 300 grand worth of projects off that effort. Because, I'm, because similar minded people make decisions based on similar criteria, based on similar priorities. But if you don't understand what makes your most profitable and best client experiences, what the similarities are, you physically can't focus on them. So part of it is demographics, right? Where are they? How old are they? What's their income level? Some of those things. But then psychographically is really where you can get into the hearts of those people. Because if you understand they're into wine or they're into beer, or like every client you was very, very, they were very focused on making sure their wine collection got put together properly, or their wine fridge was in a, a certain position. Well, hey, if you realize that a lot of people like wine, you know, that's kind of one of those similarities, focus on some wine content. You're going to relate to that ideal market better. You're going to be able to talk about real life experiences that you've gone through that make you more believable to that type of clientele. So I'm going to recap real quick. 10 most profitable, 10 highest, most enjoyable client experiences. Find some, ideally you're going to have two or three that overlap on both lists. Then sit down and say, what was similar about these? And then focus all of your efforts from a messaging and content perspective on that. I think that's fascinating. I mean, that goes back to, you know, your, I can only assume your corporate experience, building out business personas and creating highly targeted marketing campaigns to the things that they care about, essentially. I mean, that was part of it. But honestly, like, I kind of went through the process when, because when I started with the remodeling company, like our average project was like, I want to say it was like 22 or $2,500. We didn't have a mission. It, he was in a position where he needed to put food on the table. And he, I'm, so I went through this decision making with him. So I learned Hey, what was, what was similar about these two awesome client experiences? What was similar about this? Let's focus on that. You know, I realized that, you know, Charlotte's a big banking business and like vice executive vice presidents was a great client base for me. So I started talking about, Hey, if you're an executive vice president at one of the banks in Charlotte, you live in the NODA area. Well, let's talk to you about what you might be considering with your next remodel project. Well, the minute you say those things, there's three things that someone can raise their hand. Like, Oh, he's talking to me. Mm. Well, that's how I pre-qualify people before they called me. Cause somebody who's like, well, I don't work at a bank and I'm looking in another part of town. Maybe I lost some decent projects, but I'll tell you, I qualified out a lot more bad and related to a lot more good because I understood those certain criteria that I could put into my messaging. So I learned it through trial and error, honestly. I was like, oh, I want more clients like that. Well, let's go talk to those types of people in my content. And that's kind of how I learned. And I kind of formalized the process later. I actually worked with my marketing director, who's he's my marketing guy, he doesn't work for me, but he does all my content creation. And we kind of talked about how we could create a more formalized process for it. And that's kind of what we came up with. I love that. I think that's great. I also admire you for banishing that scarcity mindset of saying, hey, well, I might lose a couple of people, but at least I, I qualified the deals that I really wanted to work with. Every single person on this call listening will say there's at least 20% of the clients they wish they didn't have last year. So don't pretend that you enjoyed it anyway. Man, I love your energy, Mike. It's, <laughs> it is amazing I'm very passionate about this this is this is me all the time if you listen to any of my content i am the same you just want to banish clients that are a pain in the butt to deal with and make sure that you are working with clients that you like to work with because i'll just make your job more enjoyable well and one bad client's more time consuming than five good clients so yeah. why, why, why do i want to do that to myself i love that yeah. so a lot of your uh, work also is making sure that clients keep track of and work their leads. So like, what are some tactics that you employ to increase conversion rates? The biggest thing I would say is just having some visibility and transparency around it. There's so many people that still don't use CRMs or even any type of trackable. They're like, I sent him a proposal. If he wants to work with me, they'll call me back. No, that's not how this works anymore, everybody. So having some sort of a structured follow-up process is probably the best answer to your question. But the only way to do that is to have some transparency into what proposals you've actually sent out. So I would highly suggest getting some sort of a CRM tool. Like I actually built one in Excel. It's incredibly easy to use. I built it for what I wanted it to be. I still use it to this day. Like it's the Excel file I use at the roofing company when we sold $5 million in roofing. Like it can work for any size business. And it had some intuitive kind of conditional formatting that alerted me when certain activities need to happen. Because that's the biggest thing is, is if you're just looking at a lot of guys still write stuff out, right? Like right now, there's somebody listening to this, probably looking at their desk and they have a, a manila 
notepad with a bunch of to do's on it. Well, when it's all on the same on the same pad, there's no way to like know when it needs to happen or how it needs to happen or or like it doesn't need to even be on your radar until it needs to happen. So get it off of your list. Well, if you don't know when certain tasks need to happen, which you can set reminders, you can set certain things in these CRMs. But follow up is huge. You know, I, I ran a an analysis once and, and equated about forty percent of my sales to follow up. Mm. Um, would some of those people hired me anyway? Maybe, maybe not. But I said, if I had a fall with them at least three times, I'm counting them as a follow-up win. 40% over a five and a half year period, I sold $10 million in projects. That's $4 million in revenue I equated directly to my follow-up process. So I would say like you, to follow up appropriately, you need transparency and visibility into what your actual pipeline looks like. So first you need to get a system in place of actually track what leads have come in, what proposals have been sent out, who's been communicated with, and then follow up appropriately based on, you know, a standardized follow up process for you and anybody in your business. Yeah. This is the part where I say that service Titan is a CRM that allows you to do that. But <laughs> I was going to let you say it. <laughs> I am not being paid by service Titan to drive you in that direction. I promise. But it's huge, and especially with some of the more modern upgrades that weren't around five years ago, there's so much you can automate that you don't have to like actually do yourself, like with the meeting alerts and the, the appointment alerts and the follow-ups. And there's a lot of things that you can, it's I'll, I'll, I'll be fair, it's time consuming on the front end to like get some of those things built out. But once it's built out, you never have to touch it again. And you, those automations just, just happen automatically. So I think it's a huge upgrade in a lot of the systems. Like I've used, you know, some of your competition that, you know, five, 10 years ago wasn't the same way. Cause I've, I haven't really been in the service side and you guys are trying to transition more in the remodeling world at this point, but a few years ago, you know, very service focused and I wasn't in that space, but you know, what's happened with the technology to be able to automate a lot of those processes. So you don't have to do it, but your client experience is still impacted positively. That's a huge asset to any business. And from the cost for the value add is, I mean, pennies on the dollar. Totally. In your experience, in the industries that you've worked in, how many of your clients get repeat business from their customers? Um, a lot. I mean, I think a lot. <laughs> but I'll tell you, like, that's a gift and a curse because mm -hmm. some people rely on that as a crutch and stop going out to develop new business. And you know, eventually, like, depending on what you sell, they may not need you, but once a year, once every other year, maybe once every five years. So if you're not continuing to add into that ecosystem, so yes, it's very important to get repeat business. You need a, you need a touch process to stay in front of those people over that's over time. But there's so many people that I think rely on that word of mouth approach that don't have a good social media presence that don't put out content that don't network that don't prospect. You know, I think some people use it as a crutch and that's how you get stagnant. Like I've been at 600 grand in revenue the last five years. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, stop relying on word of mouth only. Sometimes you got to go out and hunt for more business. So I think it's a gift and a curse for some people because yeah, it got you to that wherever you're at right now, but you're going to be stuck there if not reducing in revenue because of it, because you're not finding more people to add to that pipeline, we'll call it. Yeah. You, you actually do a lot of cool stuff on social media and specifically, I know you you're in North Carolina. And, you know, when I found out that you were in construction and remodeling, I was like, oh, well, that totally makes sense. North Carolina is like the new Florida for New Yorkers, essentially. There's a lot of new building. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, so talk to me a little bit about how I say this, by the way, because my dad listened to your podcast because they were considering moving to North Carolina. Okay. Um, I, I'm probably not a great representation of the, of the market. I, I'm <laughs> from the North originally as well. So all my family, I grew up in Pittsburgh, but all my family's in Jersey. So yeah, they don't want to go to Florida anymore. It's North Carolina. It's like a nice, I don't know. I don't know how it happened, but it happened. So I think we get four seasons. Like I think they moved to Florida, but they missed the winter. Like they yeah. don't want that winter is up there, but they want four seasons. And I think the Carolinas gives you a good four season approach. And you don't get too much snow. That's, that's the key. One day a year. Love it. So talk to me about, you know, how you use social media and marketing to really speak to your audience and your demographic, right? Um, I know that's kind of a broad question, but I would love for you to answer it in respect of, you know, I've been operating in the North Carolina market. We've got a lot of transplants coming here looking to build new things and just, you know, have at that question. So the biggest thing I'll say is, and this is like the biggest 
biggest word of the year, we'll call it. It's the word of 2020, be authentic, right? But what does that mean? And I've, so I've been working really hard to try and find a way to make that relative to your day-to-day -day experience to make content creation easier. So there's two things I preach on that I think make it incredibly easy to not only great, create good content, but consistent content. So the first thing is the hesitation to post something. Well, will this matter? Will someone push back? Does anybody even care? So the mindset that I, I kind of took the approach on, because I went through that growth period as well. And uh, if what I teach on and what I, what I live by is if what I have to say or talk about will bring value to one person, it's irresponsible of me to not post it. Hmm. I don't care if 99 people unfollow me or hate me for it. I mean, don't get super like controversial, right? But if what you have to talk about for your business, for your audience, for your type of clients will bring value to one person, it's irresponsible of you to, to not post it. That'll help you get over the hump to start posting consistently. Because if you can say, yeah, I think some, I think one person would benefit from this. Because people always go to the, the three people in their life, their aunt, their mom, their brother, their cousin, that's going to give them crap for that post. They don't think about the 13 potential clients that might see it. So get over the fact that some people are not going to love you for it. Use your personal account to promote your business. It's your livelihood. You have nothing to lose other than people who are never going to hire you anyway. Right. And that's the biggest thing is people put so much focus on the people in their audience that are not their ideal client anyway, but they don't want to hear the crap from their cousin. Your cousin's never going to hire you. It doesn't matter if he loves what you post or hates what you post. He's still never going to hire you. So it doesn't really matter. Use your, use your outlet, use your audience to scale your business, but then how to tactically do that on a regular basis. So I preach a problem cause solution benefit structure to content. What is the problem somebody's having? Why are they having it? What are you suggesting they do? And what will they get if they do what you suggest? And it's very rarely is it, is it hire me? It's consider this, it's look at this, it's ask these questions, it's can, you know, here's how to solve this problem, whatever it is. So at the end of every day, as business owners, we are problem solvers. It's what you do for a living. We just do it in different environments, but you're a problem solver. So if you sit in your truck and you need a trigger for this, especially if you're new to social media, like when I started doing this, it was, I wasn't allowed to get out of my vehicle at home until I walked through this process. And that's kind of the same thing I teach with my clients is you need a trigger to change an activity. What is the biggest problem I solved today? Why did it happen? What did I do to solve it? And what was the result of solving that problem? And then get on social media and talk about it. Hmm. Hey, I was dealing with this client today and man, the inspector just did not approve the plumbing. And, you know, it's really frustrating that happens because it delays the project and everything. But what we're going to do is I, I had a very specific conversation with my plumber about it to make sure that we can avoid this going forward. So we don't run into these, these again. That says a number of things about your business. You're focused on the client experience. You put the client first, you solve problems, you manage your subs, you operate with integrity, you try and you have a focus of keeping things on, on time without saying any of that. Cause everything I just described about what you want to say about yourself is not competitive. How you do things is what makes you competitive. Here's the misconception that I run into a lot. Like you think as I'll use a kitchen remodeler that the way you do a kitchen or the way the kitchen turns out is better than everybody else. But the reality is you have access to the same materials, the same subs, the same suppliers. There's nothing unique about that. What makes you unique is the way you solve problems and the way you get a client from point A to point B. So the more times you sit back and talk about those differentiating factors and the way you make decisions and how you do things makes the, the audience grow a better, higher level credibility and trust factor with you because anybody can say we put the client first and we focus on delivering products on time. Talking about how you actually make that happen on a regular basis changes how your audience engages with you. Because ultimately, anybody can say it once. It's hard for somebody to fake it for three months. Because I'll tell you, for me, right, hiring a coach is a very difficult decision for a lot of people because you're basically... I sell hope for a living. You hire me hoping I can solve your problems. Well, you know how you determine that? Based on how I've been solving problems for the last three to six months. Because I'll tell you, the average person who hires me engages with my content for at least three months before reaching out for the intent of potentially hiring me for my services. But when I think about my content right now, the content I put out right now is for the client I don't even know about yet. Because if I don't put this content out, 
they're not going to be able to go through their decision-making process in their head to grow that credibility and trust factor for the fact that they think I can help them. So it's incredibly important to talk about how you do what you do, not just that you believe that you are a great contractor who puts the client first and, and delivers projects on time. How do you do that? And I think that what is the biggest problem I had today? Why did it happen? What did I do about it? And what was the result of doing that? I had a really bad employee today that really messed one of my client's houses up. It's a really sad situation. I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about it, but I had to let him go because he just did not meet the culture and the client experience we were looking for. So this gives me the opportunity to fill that role with somebody who would be better suited for, for my client base and be able to deliver the experience that I hold very powerfully. Yeah, it sucks you had a, you had a bad client experience. It sucks you had to fire somebody, but now you're telling your audience that like you're going to put the client experience above everything else no matter what. That's somebody that somebody can trust because you're able to be authentic and vulnerable about what you're dealing with. So the problems can be internal, external, about a client, about you, about a sub, about an inspector, about an architect, whatever it is. But what's the biggest problem you solved today? Why did it happen? What'd you do about it? And what was the impact of taking that action? And just get on and talk about it. Dude, I think that's actually fantastic. And that's a really great way for people to think about content creation. You know, as a content marketer myself, we do stuff for Service Titan. I talk with a lot of customers about, you know, they're all thinking about how to do content and they want it to be education based, you know. But this is, you know, exactly that. If you get real and you get authentic with the folks that are watching you from the sidelines, they'll become more comfortable with you um, the more authentic you are. So I think that's actually a brilliant strategy. Also, that one, two, four, three, four approach of, of doing it alleviates also that creative block that could happen when you're thinking about what to post. Yeah, I mean, because it's what, what I always tell people, because I think a lot, of, a lot of people think they have to create content. I have to go create content. It's something else for my to-do list. No, I want you to document what you're already doing and then put it out on the internet. Yeah. So you're just documenting what you're already doing in your world because... 50% of the stuff that most people do is their competitive advantage. They take it for granted because they've always done it that way. So just talk about what you're doing already anyway and put it on your social media or your YouTube or whatever you're utilizing. And it puts it out there and it doesn't take more time. You don't have to sit down and say, well, I need to write out a video script because I need to get a vi video out. No, like just go document what you did today with that project manager. Yeah. That's for real. People don't want to see a scripted video. They want to see what you're actually like. What's it going to be like working with you for six months while you're in my kitchen, in my home, disrupting my life? I know this isn't going to be an easy process, but I want to know who is going to be in my house. Who's yeah. my, who am I putting around my kids? That's what people really think about. Not, I wonder how good he is at leveling cabinets. <laughs> no, it's like, how, how likely is this person to deliver the, the product I want or service I want effectively for a reasonable price that I can trust in. That's all people really want to know. I love that. I think that also applies to service and replacement too, not just long-term remodeling jobs, of course. I agree. You've been mentioning subcontractors quite a bit, and I'm, I'm interested in going into that field, but I also really want to hear your take because, you know, at the beginning of this interview, you talked a lot about how the industry has changed and how our audience has changed and, you know, how to be successful contractors, we need to adapt. So 2020, obviously. COVID-19 sucks, Hits, hit everyone, especially construction. So how do you think this is going to shape the future of the industry, you know, the two main ones that you work in, which is construction and remodeling? I think the biggest thing is using technology to your advantage and, and using virtual consultations is going to be more of an expectation than a nuisance at this point. Having more of a digital online process for proposals and contracts and digital signing and, you know, you're not gonna be able to go pick up checks anymore. You need to have a credit card processing option. But in, in, at a high level, I think if I had to put a sentence on it is you just need to be easier to do business with. Hmm. I see so many people stuck in these processes where like, yeah, I'll mail you that proposal. If you're still mailing proposals, which I still see to this day, you're losing business because people aren't taking you seriously. Right. So little things like that, like I, I call it the Amazon effect, like people want, they expect to be able to take as much time as they want to make a decision. And then when they make a decision, they want it today. 
And then, and a part of that is our ability to set proper expectations with realistic timelines. Hey, if you tell me, yes, the permit's going to take two weeks, because if they think you're going to be able to start the next day, they're sadly mistaken. But if they don't know that, they're going to tell themselves a story in their head. So your ability to be proactively communicating the reality of the situation in the process, where before you could get away with some of that stuff. Now, I think it's, I think people just have a higher expectation of the information they're going to have before things happen, not, oh, you're the contractor, I, I trust in you. No, like, what do you mean? Why is this? How is that? So the more proactive that I think you are with your communication about how things happen, when they happen, and why they happen that way, I think that's the part a lot of contractors miss. They're afraid to get a little transparent in the, not just what happens and how it happens, but why it's done that way. Because there's so many different parts of the process that don't go as smoothly as they should. And we have no control over that. But if the client doesn't know why it's done that way, you know, I'll use the example of, you know, let's say you put in some crown molding and it's caulked but not painted yet. Well, the client doesn't know that it's going to be painted. They might come to you frustrated the next day because is it, this is done. This is what you think is done. When you're like, no, it's not done. Oh, okay. No, I thought I thought someone told me it was done. No, like just articulate the process. And that's a little thing, but those little I call them deductions from the the relationship account. Like everybody has a relationship account. When you do something wrong, it's a deduction. When you do something above expectations, it's a it's a it's an, a deposit. Mm. So like when you show up on time, that's a deposit because they weren't expecting that. When you deliver the proposal on time, that's a deposit because they weren't expecting that. When your drywall guy leaves the day without cleaning the dust off the china cabinet, that's a deduction. Well, those little things don't mean much as long as the account's positive. But if there's been more deductions than deposits, that when that that little thing 75% of the way through the con through the project blows up in your face, even though it's a little thing, you don't realize there's been so many little things along the way that you didn't think were important. But if you would have just proactively communicated it, the client wouldn't be in the position they're in right now, frustrated and lost faith and trust in you. And it's really hard to get that back mid project. You're just going to be dealing with somebody looking over your shoulder, whether it's a single transaction service world or whether it's a remodeling world. Once you lose that trust, it's very, very difficult to get it back. So very long answer to your question, but ideally I think you need to be easier to do business with by creating more of a virtual digital process. If I had to put a to a sentence on it. No, you definitely did. And I think over communicate, the more you over communicate, the more deposits you make. And I think, I think that's a trap that literally everyone in every industry falls into, which is essentially you live this world day. Like, and if we take the remodeling example, you do that all the time. It's so easy to just not communicate with the clients because you know, this process in and out, but you have to treat basically every person you communicate with as a novice. So I think that's great. Let's talk. We're coming in at the last 10 minutes and my um, mind is literally buzzing with all of the knowledge that you dropped. So thank you for that. Talk to me about your podcast. You have big stud sales and you also did remodeling in the Carolinas. So talk yeah, to me so about what I you have, guys do there. I have two podcasts. Remodeling in the Carolinas is more of an interview style where I bring on experts in the industry to educate not just contractors, but homeowners was our approach. Like, how do, I, how do I help homeowners understand what contractors deal with, right? So I brought in, and we talk about everything from marketing to legal to insurance. You know, I'll tell you, one of the most downloaded episodes on that was the, was the insurance episode. It's absolutely, it's got four times the downloads of every other episode we have. I, I don't understand it, but it's really cool. But, you know, so it talks about all things construction from internal, external, supplier, I want to really make it very broad spectrum, help educate contractors and homeowners alike who to better understand what the world we live in. And then Big Stud Sales is more of a rant style podcast where me and a co-host basically get on every week and talk sales, marketing, business development, leadership, scalability. And so there's more of a, Ramon the Carolinas was more for the audience. Big Stud Sales is more for me to just have a platform to rant on, if I'm being honest about it. That's all good. Yeah, because I really want to highlight the guest on Ramon the Carolinas. On big stud sales, I'm highlighting like a conversation like this. I'm very open. I'm pretty transparent. I'm very authentic about the way I go about approaching things. So I, I'm able to be more me. So that's why I created big stud sales. So I think, and I think anybody listening would, would appreciate when you have a podcast you listen to, you get used to the routine. And sometimes if it's a, if you have a lot of guests and all of a sudden you have a, a solo podcast, it doesn't meet the expectation. And if you have a typically a solo podcast and you bring on a bunch of guests, all of a sudden it doesn't meet the expectation. So I intentionally created two ones interview style, ones more rant 
style. Dig it. Yeah, they're both really great podcasts. And actually, Big Stud Sales was featured on our summer series while, um, and it should be, it was live in July. This episode won't be live till fall. So I don't want to confuse people with timelines. Oh, I do all the time. <laughs> um, is there anything that you wish we had talked about that we didn't? Oh, man, what a great question. That's a good one. Thanks. I got it from a, a reporter friend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my manager at Service Titan, uh, he came from a very well-known newspaper and he was like, that's, that's the money question. You can take it. I won't, I won't be offended. Yeah, I might, I might use that, but I don't want to stump people like this. <laughs> <laughs> that's my goal to just stump and make people uncomfortable, obviously. No, I, I think, and obviously I'm biased on this because I'm a coach, right? We kind of touched on this, but heavily invest in yourself. You are your biggest asset to your business. Like whether that's content, free content, get into a group, get into a mastermind, get into a group of people who have been through or going through what you're going through. And I think we touched on this. So I don't want to say we didn't talk about it, but I think it's incredibly important. I see so many people struggle alone because they're afraid of asking for help. And I don't like seeing it because you're going to fail. At some point, if you don't get help, you're going to reach a point, you're going to make the wrong decision and you're going to fail because of it. When there's somebody that's open, honest, there's, there's, comp there's probably competitors that you can call in other markets. There's business coaches out there. There's content, there's books, there's podcasts, there's YouTube videos. So many people get stuck in, well, this is the way we've always done it. Stop thinking that way. And if you're somebody right now who's about to take over their dad or mom's business, you can't do it the way that you got brought up doing it anymore. You've got to adjust. You've got to adapt. You've got to modernize your approach. So go ask for help because it'll speed your success rate from potentially failing in two to three years to being wildly successful in 18 months because you're going to get guided in the right path. And I see too many people hesitant to do that or afraid to invest in themselves. And Bottom line is, as a business owner, you are the most valuable asset of your business. So why would you not want to be continually sharpening that ax? Yep. hundred percent agree. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, how should they go about finding you? At Winrate Consulting on Instagram is where a lot of my content stuff goes. I have a free Facebook group just called Construction Selling. A lot of great content there. Just Mike at Winrate Consulting if you want to email me. Those are the best places to go. Awesome. Well, Mike, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Really, uh, you dropped the knowledge super hardcore, and I very much appreciate it. Thank you for being a guest on Toolbox for the Trades. Thanks for having me. Ever wonder how much your business is worth? So many owners ask that question and have no idea where to turn for an answer. In just a few clicks, Service Titan's new Service Business Valuation Calculator can give you an easy and free estimate of the current value of your business. Whether you're thinking about selling your company or looking to track growth, check it out now. Visit servicetitan.com slash value. Again, that's servicetitan.com slash value. See how much your business is worth today. Want to network with fellow service entrepreneurs and former guests of this podcast? Join our private Facebook group, Toolbox for the Trades, to get immediate access to the best tips, tricks, and tactics from fellow service entrepreneurs. Visit facebook.com slash group slash toolbox for the trades, or click the link in our show notes to join. See you online.